Welcome to the final video in the series for this unit, covering topics 3.8 and 3.9, Human Population Dynamics and Demographic Transition. When it comes to population growth, humans are like any other organism. We are constrained by whatever resources are available for our population to increase in size. But unlike other organisms, our innovative nature and development of technologies have made it possible for us to manipulate our environment and increase the carrying capacity of Earth for our species. We've invented methods and technologies to maximize agricultural yield, develop medicines and medical treatments to improve human health, and extend life expectancy. So, although it would be impossible to consider humans as separate from the rest of nature, through our ingenuity, we have created many exceptions for ourselves to the rules of nature that other species must abide by. In the late 17 and early 1800s, an English scholar by the name of Thomas Malthus develop methods and influence thought around economic and demographic theory. One of his most important positions that relates to our study involves population growth and how it's influenced by food production technology. Malthus observed that new ideas and innovations in methods for producing food would lead to a surplus of it that surplus would allow for populations to grow in size. But because the growth of the population would eventually reach that new technologically improved food production capacity, population growth would be hindered. This would create the need for the development of even newer and more advanced technologies to improve agricultural yield even more. Unfortunately, population growth would outpace agricultural production, even with new te technological advancements. According to the idea of the Malthusian catastrophe, famine and war would result as the primary mechanisms for limiting human population growth. Either pessimistic or realistic, depending on your perspective, Malthus argued that populations would grow at the expense of those less fortunate who would be subjected to disease outbreaks and starvation. As a species, anatomically modern humans have existed for approximately 200,000 years according to the fossil record. For the vast majority of that time, our population remained relatively small. Humans were primarily gatherers and hunters, and relied upon whatever food they were able to find, or lucky enough to catch. This meant that a huge amount of time and energy was dedicated to simply just surviving. Estimates supported by scientific evidence tell us that the global human population was probably somewhere around a million for most of that time. But around 12,000 years ago, arguably one of the most important developments in the history of civilization began, the agricultural revolution. Rather than searching for food, people began to plant seeds from the plants they ate, as well as keep and domesticate animals. This represented some of the very first large-scale efforts at artificial selection where humans selected for particular traits in plants and animals, driving their evolution for our benefit. Because the nomadic way of life was now ending for many groups of humans, and a more consistent and relatively abundant food supply was available, people now had the resources and the free time to have more children than was previously possible. The global human population began to creep up. The most significant increases in population occurred after the Industrial Revolution began, but especially in the last century. Although the last hundred or so years have seen different population increases from year to year, the 20th and first fifth of this century 
easily saw the greatest increase from about 1.6 billion people in 1900 to nearly 8 billion today. In spite of all our innovation, we are still subject to Mother Nature's limiting influences. We are at the mercy of density-independent limiting factors such as storms and droughts that harm agricultural production and heat waves, like a couple in the early and mid-2015 that killed 2,200 people in India and 2,500 people in Pakistan, as well as one in Europe in 2003 that killed 15,000 people. Factors like those and density-dependent limiting factors like access to clean air and water, food availability, and disease outbreaks all limit the size of populations, as well as how quickly they grow. Generally, those countries that are more developed, both industrial and economically, have a lower growth rate than countries that are less developed in those ways. Less developed countries also have a much larger proportion of young individuals in their population, and the majority of growth in the next 50 to 100 years is expected to be in those countries. An important and easy to understand and compare measure of population growth is the amount of time it takes for a population to double in size. A clever trick to use, common in mathematics and finance, is called the rule of 70. While there are variations of this rule, like the rule of 72 and the rule of 69.3, the rule of 70 is much easier to work with. The equation is simple. To determine a population's doubling time, you simply divide 70 by that population's annual growth rate as a percentage. For example, the current population in the United States is approximately 330 million, and its annual growth rate is 0.6%. Therefore, the population will double to 660 million in about 117 years. For the approximately 91 million people in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the growth rate is 3.2% per year. So in just about 22 years, there will be nearly 180 million people in that country. For those populations that have a negative growth rate, the rule of 70 can be used to determine its halving time, how long it will take for the population to reduce by half. In Japan, the annual growth rate is negative 0.2. So it will take about 350 years for the population of Japan to go from 126 million to 63 million. Having provided all of those examples, here is one critically important factor to remember. Those estimates will only come to pass if growth rate remains the same over that period of time. A population whose growth rate increases will have a shorter doubling time, and if growth rate decreases, it will take longer for the population to double. In the early 1900s, demographers in America and France made similar observations about demographic patterns and the growth of human populations. It wasn't until 1945 that American demographer Frank Notstein produced a formal model of demographic transition. Demographic transition theory has since become one of the most widely accepted ideas in social science. The model identifies the changes a population experiences as it becomes more educated and industrialized and economic opportunities expand. As societies progress through those changes, they also experience characteristic changes to birth and death rates. The demographic transition model contains four generally accepted stages, but with increasing regularity, a fifth stage is often included. Each of the stages of demographic transition has a set of characteristics that help define it. In stage one, both birth rates and death rates are relatively high, which keeps the population size low. Because of early improvements in healthcare and sanitation, societies in stage two experience a decrease in the death rate. 
but because the birth rate remains high, since children are an economic advantage, population size increases rapidly. In stage three, largely because of improvements in healthcare, child mortality rates decrease. This fact, combined with an increasing urbanization of the population and improving economic opportunities for women, results in families having fewer children. The birth rate now begins to fall and population growth slows. By stage four, populations in this category have access to family planning and contraception. Women have relatively higher statuses than in previous stages, and they wait longer before having their first child. This results in a population that is either fairly stable in size or maybe increasing ever so slightly. Part of the reason why stage five is a topic for debate among demographers is because some propose that populations in this stage would experience a gentle increase in size, whereas others suggest a slow decrease. The argument exists between the biological pressure for organisms to reproduce and the cultural desire where more affluent individuals are less willing to allocate resources to creating and caring for offspring. Whichever may be the case for a potential stage five society, we've been consistently wrong with regard to population projections in the last century mainly due to poor estimates in life expectancy and fertility. Back in 2004, a group within the UN provided population estimates for the year 2300, ranging from 2.3 billion to just over 36 billion, depending on growth rate. They even included an extremely unrealistic, literally impossible, perhaps even laughable estimate based on the fertility rates of the late 1990s. 134 trillion. I hope you got a laugh out of that too as this video and this unit comes to an end. See you in unit four, but until then, take care.